through the week when you walk in, yes. there's a presence that comes where you know everything is going to be all right. Yes. There is a, a this too shall pass spirit when you walk in the house. And I've been in this place before. And at some period in my life, I was able to look back and say, I don't know how I made it through at certain point. I could have took myself out there. But I made it through. And the same challenges that face you today, look at your neighbor and say, this too shall pass. It shall pass. It shall pass. Amen. Thank you. Bless the name of our God. If you would, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Acts, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, I'm going to uh, begin reading, conclude at verse 17. And Saul, so. amen, and it reads, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone who were of the way, somebody say the way, the way. whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Yeah. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Somebody say Shekinah glory. Shekinah. Then he fell to the ground. And heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goals. I'm going to read that again for emphasis. It is hard for you to kick against the gold. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Yeah. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Yeah. Then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. Somebody say, no one. no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate or drank. Amen. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for me, for one called Saul of Tarsus. I'm going to skip down to verse 17, and I'm going to conclude. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be Feel, somebody say feel. Feel with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. Let us pray. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you this morning. I pray, Father, that your word will go forth with power, with authority, with clarity. I pray that you would remove my thinking. I pray that you would remove my mouth. May I decrease so that you can increase in this vessel and speak to your people. God, we thank you 
and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The story is told of this woman who is expecting to have a child. She is 37 weeks pregnant. Her and her husband, they are excited to have this baby. They've been waiting a long time for this very moment. They, they can't wait to see how the child will look, how big it's going to be, the color of the child. They are ready. They are expecting to have this baby. So week 37 passes, then week 38, and they're still waiting. Then week 39 passes, and they're still there. Week 42 arrives, and the baby has not came yet. The woman is still pregnant. And the doctor walks in the door, and he says, Ma'am, I apologize, but we have to induce your lady. Well, the woman says, no, I, I, I want to have my baby naturally. It's, it's, a, it's a family tradition that we have it naturally. I know the pain I have to go through, but I want to do this naturally. I don't want my labor to be induced. I don't want any medicine. Can we just wait one more week? Can we just wait one more? The doctor says, no, ma'am, it's too risky. We have to induce your labor. Because your body, your body is not responding. And he says, ma'am, we'll, we'll give you an injection. And it's going to temporarily damage you with side effects. But, he said, in order for this to take place, we're going to have to induce your labor because your body is not responding. I want to talk to you from this subject and this topic in mind, induced transition. Induced transition. Just as this woman's body did not respond to the reality of what was going on on the inside of her body, we don't respond to the reality of what God has placed in us. What do you mean, preacher? We don't respond to the call that God has placed, thank you, on our lives. We know that it's there. We acknowledge that the call on our lives is there. We can feel the kicking of God's presence in us. We can feel the fluttering of the anointing in us. But we don't take the call that's on our lives seriously. We say responses like, well, I know I'm called, but I'm, I'm not ready yet. Or we make excuses and say, I am just running from my call. We know that it's there, but we won't prioritize it in our lives. We won't walk into our calling. We won't investigate. What is it, God, that you have for me to do in this life? So God has a remedy for that. Just as a woman with a baby has to be induced to have her baby, God will induce, God will induce you so that you can birth his ministry. What do you mean by that, preacher? Yeah. What I mean is God will damage things in your life to manifest the calling out of your life. Now, what do you mean, preacher, by damage? You meant to tell me God, who has a hand of goodness, a hand of mercy, will cause damage? What do you mean by damage? I did not say destroy. I said Damage. What I mean by damage is more of damage control. It is the same as renovating. It's like an old house that now has to function as a restaurant now. So we have to damage the old walls in that house to fit the functionality and calling now of a restaurant. It's really a reconstruction. God will reconstruct you. He will damage things in your life, yes. not you, not destroy you, but he will damage all things in your life that you don't need. Yeah. And sometimes in a season, we will think it's the devil. 
we will get confused about it. Why is this happening to me? When really God is just reconstructing you. He's damaging some things in your life to fit the functionality of his calling on your life. He will induce the transition. Since you are hesitant, since you are still looking back as the great physician, I'm going to inject you with my spirit. And it's going to damage you with some side effects, but I'm going to induce this transition. As we read the text here, Saul's transition has been induced by God. Here is Saul, a persecutor of the church. He would bring anyone who was of the way, bound, whether they are women or men, he would bring them bound. Saul on a mission. So here is Saul. Because he has a calling on his life. He is responsible for bringing the message to the Gentiles. He is responsible for bringing the message to the Roman Empire. Here is Saul who is responsible for writing almost half of the New Testament. Here is Saul. He has a calling on his life. And his transition from sinner to a saved man has to be induced by God. Because he was running from his real calling. So here is Saul. He is on his way to Damascus. He is ready to persecute every believer. He is on his way on the road of Damascus and he is stopped by a roadblock. It is a divine roadblock. See, when you are running from your calling, when you are really running from the thing that God has called you to, you can believe that there is a divine roadblock that's coming for your life. Here is Saul. He is on his way to Jerusalem. And the Bible records that all of a sudden, a light shone from heaven. And the next thing Saul sees is his face on the ground. In darkness. Saul has an encounter with Jesus. After this encounter, he is converted. The Bible records at the end, the scales fall from his eyes. But his transition is induced. It's induced by God. It's not forced. When I say induced, what I mean it is more like a stimulation. See, when the doctor injects a woman that's expecting, he is not really forcing her lady. He is stimulating her body to respond to what's on the inside of her. See, God will stimulate. He will stimulate you to produce the calling out of your life. To produce, to manifest the ministry that's on your life. To manifest the anointing that's on your life. To manifest the goals that you have or the dreams that you have as it relates to God. When you don't respond, when you are not obedient and you have a heavy weight that's on your life, you can believe that there is a stimulation coming. There is a roadblock ahead of your life. And there are certain roadblocks you can turn around from and avoid. But when you have a divine encounter with God, there is no turning around. Because there's angels in the back waiting to trail you. Angels on the side. It's a divine encounter. It is a stimulation. It is induced. It's an induced transition. So what will God damage in my life to manifest his calling out of my life? That's what I want to talk about. What is it? What is it in particular that God will damage? When I see these things happening in my life, I know that it is God. Because like I said, we will confuse it to be the devil. And we'll go in the wrong direction. Really, it's God's hand. I'm reconstructing. I'm renovating your life. I'm developing you. I'm tearing down some walls over here. Because you have to fit the new calling, the new functionality. You're not a house anymore. Now I've made you a business building. You have to tear down some things. 
to create a new capacity in you. There is more of you that's required. So now I'm going to get rid of some things in your life to birth something new in your life. The first thing that God damaged in Saul's life was he damaged his ambition. He damaged Saul's ambition. Somebody say ambition. Damaged his ambition. Ambition is what I want to do. It is my dreams. It is my goals. It is my career. It is what I want to do. It is about me. How much money I can make. How many degrees that I can get. It is about me. And it is trying to tailor and fit God in your own ambition. And it simply does not work. See, you have to understand, see, Saul was an educated man. He was a man of wisdom. He was a man of, of, of Hebrew philosophy and Greek literature. And he had his own goals in mind. Saul's goal was, I'm going to persecute all of the believers. Saul actually thought, because of what he learned in his teaching, he actually thought that this was the right thing to do. He actually thought that he was obeying God. So Saul had his own ambition in mind. He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to get all of them. He had his plans in mind. He had everything mapped out. The Bible records that he goes and he gets approval from the high priest that he might go and bring all who are of the way bound to Jerusalem. Saul has his own ambition. I got my own thing in mind. But what happens is when I have my own ambition and Saul has his goals, he has his dreams intact. He is on his way to Jerusalem and all of a sudden a light shines from heaven and Saul is now on the ground. See, when you have your own ambition and you have your own thing in mind, don't be surprised when it hits the ground. Don't be surprised when it hits the ground. Have, have anybody in here ever had a ground experience? You invested in something. You put your heart into something and you was disappointed by it. You knew this was the right thing to do. You knew this was the right direction to go. And now here you are with ground experiences. It hit the ground. The relationship has hit the ground. The job you thought was the right job. You had it all in your heart and here it is. It has hit the ground. You are miserable. You simply know this is not the place where God has has purpose for you to be. It is a ground experience. Here is Saul. Had his own ambition in mind. On his way to Jerusalem and all of a sudden he is now facing the ground. He had good intention. He had an opportunity. Everything looked good. But now it is on the ground. The Bible records in Proverbs 19, 21, many of the plans of a man, but it is the Lord's plan that will prevail. See, God is trying to get you to a place. The reason why you have ground experience in your life is because God is trying to get you to a place where you realize that his plan is better than your plan. Regardless of how it looks, my policy is the best policy. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is the Lord's plan that will prevail. The Bible records that if you take delight in the Lord, then I'm going to give you your heart desire. What is delight? That simply means you like the same thing I like. It's no longer you want the cake and I want the vegetables. No, it's we want the vegetables together. Your desire means a healthy desire. You desire the same things that God desires. 
And God is saying, when you get on one accord with me like that, I'm going to give you your heart's desire. For if you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, then all things is going to be added to you. It's going to be added to you. But I need your ambition to change. I need it to be about me and not about you. For I know the plans that I have for you. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God's policy is the best policy. He says, for my plan is better than mint life. My policy is better than New York life, or Gerber life, or any insurance that you can come up with. Because the worldly insurance have an expiration date. Somebody say expiration date. But heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words will never pass. The grass may look and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord, it stands forever. See, when you go all over the earth, Jesus, he tells Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the goals. It is, somebody say, it's a losing it's a losing battle. So here is Saul. Saul is finally convinced. It's hard for you to kick against the goal. He is finally convinced of his call. So now the next thing, how? How do I change my ambition? How do I change my ambition to God's ambition? Well, verse 6 tells us. Verse 6 tells us, Saul says, Lord, what do you want me to do? See, sometimes when we pray, we're always asking, what do I want? God, bless me with this. God, give me increase in this. God, do this. Do that. When really it may need to be going back to the basics of God, what is it that you want me to do with this ministry? What is it that you want me to do? Or what is it that you call me to do? What are you saying, God? What am I to do today? Saul says, Lord, what do you want? me to do. And what I love about God's policy is they kick in immediately. Yes. Because Jesus immediately says right after that, arise and go. Oh. He gives him instructions immediately. Yes. See, sometimes there's a lack of clarity in our life because we're not asking the right thing from God. Yes. You're asking what you want and what you need. God is saying, just ask me. Yes. I got a request. I want you to do so. Just ask me, God, what do you want me to do? I want your ambition to be my ambition. Amen? He damaged his ambition, but not only did he damage his ambition, God damaged Saul's sight. The Bible records that after Jesus says, arise and go, not only did he damage his ambition, but after Jesus says, arise and go, Saul lifts up his head from the rocks of the road. And he opens his eyes and he noticed that God, the Shekinah glory, his light has damaged his sight. Saul cannot see. The two men that were with Saul, they could see perfectly. They could see. But here is Saul, he can't see. How is it that, that, that Saul has just had an experience with God and he is worse off than the two men who have not had an experience with God? They were speechless. They didn't know what was going on. But they can see. They are okay. Here is Saul. 
He has just had an experience with God. He has just come from church. He has just come from worship service. He has been now reading his Bible. He has been in the presence of God. He has been trying to obey God now. And here he is now. It seems he is worse off than the sinner who doesn't come to church. Than the sinner who's not in his word. He seems to be having it okay. But here I am. I have had an experience with God. And why am I worse off? Here is Saul, y'all. He is blind. He cannot see. What do you do when you are blind by God? When you can't make your way through because of God, what do you do then? How do you respond to it? As a matter of fact, why would God allow such a thing to happen. Here is Saul. He is picked out of the crowd. He's the only one that comes out and he can't see. Why am I picked out to go through these struggles, God? Why am I moving and walking in the dark in my marriage, Father? Why am I struggling financially and I can't see through this, God? Why am I picked out? I was picked to hell this diagnosis. Why am I going through these health problems? Why am I moving in the dark? God, I need clarity in my life. I need confirmation. What are you doing, God? Saul is in the dark. He cannot see. What do you do? When it is just not clear and it seems that you are transitioning and moving in the dark. Yeah. Ephesians 118. Yeah. Ephesians 118. It reads this. Paul is speaking. And he said, this is after he was converted. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glory, of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So God is telling Saul, this is the reason you're moving in the dark. He says, I want not these eyes. I blind these eyes to enlighten the eyes of your heart. That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling. See, we are not clear on what God has for us because we're looking with the wrong eyes. And sometimes God will darken these eyes to enlighten the eyes of your heart. I cause it to be dark so that you may walk by faith and not by sight. I'm upgrading the eyes of your heart because as long as you look with these eyes, you'll never know your calling and you'll never even desire your calling. You'll continue to run from your ministry. You will continue to run from growth and run from your anointing. Because even when you think of the word calling, it sounds scary. It sounds heavy. It's not quite an attractive word. You're called. Don't call me. Call to what you're just called. Oh no. That's a scary word. That's not a term that people are not Responsive to, see, we're unresponsive to that call because we look through these eyes at it. But Paul is saying it is the eyes of your heart that has to be in light that you will know the hope of his calling. I want to see myself how God sees me. The only way I see myself. How God sees me is I don't look through these eyes. I look through the eyes of my heart. And I can see me as God sees it. 
Looking through these eyes, I won't give. Looking through these eyes, I won't be obedient. Looking through these eyes, I'll get worried. I'll get burdened. Looking through these eyes, I just won't be effective yep. at anything. Yep. I have to look through the eyes of my heart. So God has to make it dark. He damages Saul's sight. So temporarily, temporarily, so that the eyes of his heart can be enlightened. What I've learned about God is that you will go through the same cycles, the same cycle of struggle, the same old, same old, every single year if you don't pass the test. And really what God is trying to do is he's trying to enlighten your heart. You're looking through the wrong lenses. Same cycle, same thing, year after year. God said, I'm trying to enlighten the heart. Somebody says, the heart. The heart. See, when I look through these eyes, the eyes of my heart, I have a right perspective of myself also. When I look, see, Saul was self-righteous. He thought he had it together. He was well educated. But God damaged these eyes to enlighten the eyes of his heart. Because the Bible records, if you keep reading, Saul went to this house on Straight Street and he was praying. And he saw, Saul saw Ananias in a vision coming to heal him. He didn't see him with these eyes. He saw him praying. He saw him with the eyes of his heart. If you keep reading that text. I'm trying to get you to fight in the spirit so you can see with these eyes. We will think we are okay. We will think we are righteous. I, just because I come to church, I read my Bible, I pray, I'm okay with God. But it's not until the light of his presence that shines on us. It's almost like driving in a car, driving in a vehicle. And, and, and you wash the car, but you don't wash the window. And as you drive it in the dark, you can't tell the spots that are on the window. But as soon as the light from the sun hits that windshield, you all of a sudden can see all of the spots that are on that window. It is because of the light and not because of the dark. All I'm saying is you can see yourself in the right light with the gospel of Jesus, when that light hits your soul. See, Saul couldn't see himself in his right mind until the light of the gospel shined and it darkened him. It darkened everything. It was really symbolic of his darkness. It was symbolic of the scales that was in his life. See, when you're living and you're doing your own thing, you're creating scales. Scales are things you think that's okay. Scales are things that you think that's right. That you think, look, I got this together. It's nothing but scales. Scales is a sign of pride, a sign of stubbornness. I got this together. I'm going to do this my way, and you cannot see. So really, what's in Saul's eye, what's blinding him is the scales. And God has to damage Saul's sight. Amen? God will. Damage your life yes. to manifest his calling out of your life. Yes. A renovation and a reconstruction. He'll do it. If you pray for someone to be saved, you, you know someone that, that's a sinner, that live in a worldly life, just pray for a roadblock. Yes. That's all you have to do. You know a calling is on their life, or you know there's righteousness in them and they're not living it out yet. Pray for a roadblock. Yes. Say, God, give them a roadblock experience. Yes, and sometimes we, 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 we get concerned about people we love that's not in here because we see the things that they're going through in their lives. They're struggling. But really, you keep praying for them because it may not be that, that, that they're struggling. It may be that God is just damaging some things in their life. Oh, He's getting them prepared for, what, for the roadblock. Hey, hey. For the soul experience. For what he's about to do. Maybe God is actually answering your prayers. 
it won't come sometimes in the form of them just showing up in church and you seeing them in this light and they all of a sudden got it together. Now. God will damage things in their life. Maybe he is answering your prayers. He is, he's just damaging things in their life. That's what's going on. He's, God is damaging Saul's life. He damaged his ambition. I'm about to be out of your way. He damaged his ambition. He damaged his sight. Then he damaged Saul's life. Somebody say he damaged his life. Here is Saul. He's sitting in this house. The Bible records. And he is depleted. Everything that Saul thought to be true. It was a lie. Everything. He cannot believe the stuff he fell for. He cannot believe the things he was raised up on in the Old Testament scriptures. He, he thought that this was it, that I need to persecute the believe. Here he is. He's sitting here and he cannot believe it. He is depleted. He is bankrupt. All of his dreams have been washed down the drain. But how many of you know that this is the place where God wants you. I want you depleted. Saul has now realized that it is God all along that has damaged his life. I damaged you so I can feel you. I'm about to end it, but the Bible records and in the last chapter that Ananias comes over. See, Saul didn't know this at first, but God is always working behind the scenes in your life. He's always moving. He's always doing something. Saul, at one point, didn't know if he was going to ever see again. He could have been blind for the rest of his life. But here is Ananias. God calls him and says, I need you to go over to Saul. And I need you to touch him. Ananias goes over and the Bible records that the scales fall from Saul's eyes. And Saul goes on and he preaches the gospel and he lives on in his call. See, God will damage things in your life to manifest his calling out of your life. Amen. He, he, he damaged Jesus' ministry. He damaged his reputation. He damaged his body. He damaged his name. He damaged Jesus' life. Jesus died. But he manifested his purpose and his calling out of that vessel. Because on the third day, he rose. And now he sits to the right hand of power. But he had to go a season of being damaged. Don't give up in the damaging process. Don't give up when God is reconstructing you. He's only damaging your life to manifest and produce the anointing, the calling, the ministry, the gift, His presence in you. Can we all stand to our feet? Stand to your feet. Because there are some people in here that are called to something. And you've been running. Not only are you called to something, but you are called to be saved. You are called to the gospel. And you've been running. Or maybe you've been called to church membership. And you've been running. If you've been running from your gift, you might as well submit to God before the roadblock happens. You don't want to run into the roadblock. 